started. There might be a few people trickling in. We do have some seats at the front if anyone else comes in. We need some front row attendees. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I'm thrilled to see this great turnout. We're almost at standing room only, so this is exciting to hear the comments and questions that you have today. My name is Andrea Eilers. I'm the Energy and Environment Program Manager here at Triangle J Towns Health Governments. I will be helping to facilitate the meeting today. Um, I will start out by giving you a little bit of background on the VW settlement, and then I'll hand it over to Mike, who will tell you a little bit about the mitigation draft plan that um, DEQ has in place. Um, and then we will open it up for questions and comments on that draft plan, or any questions you have about the VW settlement in general. So just to start, um, in 2015, the EPA cited VW um, with Clean Air Act violations. Um, they were accused with um, setting algorithms in their diesel vehicles that caused their emission control systems to perform differently when they were under testing conditions than when they were on, um, functioning on the roads, truly. So they were found guilty, and a settlement has been put in place of $14.7 billion. That settlement is broken up into three different categories, which you may have heard of. Um, the largest of the three categories, and the one that the general consumer has heard about the most, is the buyback or emissions modification portion of the funding. That is, so the current vehicles that are on the road that were affected by these modifications or algorithms um, can be either bought by, back by VW or be modified so those emission control systems function correctly now. Then there is $2 billion um, allocated to promote the use of zero emission vehicles and the infrastructure. So there has been a specific entity organization created to do this both education and development of infrastructure. They are called Electrify America, and they are working nationwide to um, install infrastructure and do general education about zero emission vehicles. Um, lastly is what we are here to talk about today, which is the effort to remediate the excess NOx emissions that were produced by these diesel vehicles that um, VW produced. So this is how it's broken down. Um, again, the largest portion of the settlement is by or modification. Zero emission vehicle investment through Electrify America is $2 billion. And the Environmental Mitigation Trust is the $2.7 billion. So, a little more details of the mitigation trust. So, a trust was set up, the national trust that will be overseeing these funds is Wilmington Trust, and each state will become, each state that would like to receive their allocation of the funds has to declare a beneficiary for those funds. Um, it is, was up to the governor of each state to declare which agency within the state would be overseeing the funds for each um, entity. In North Carolina, Governor Cooper um, selected the, the Department of Environmental Quality, specifically the Division of Air Quality, and that's why they are here today. And they had to file and indicate that they were truly interested in receiving these funds, and that has been completed. So there was an allocation, depending on how many vehicles were operating within each state. That is how the allocation of funds is spread across the country. So it's based on how many two liter VW vehicles were in those states, as well as three liter diesel vehicles. Um, for North Carolina, you can see that with those two numbers combined, we are just over $92 million allocated for funding here. That is, 3.15% of the total allocation throughout the country, which may not sound like a lot when you just say 3%. However, 
We actually fared pretty well in the scheme of the national allocations. We are about ninth on the list. Um, just a few states above us receiving more money, which means they have more of those VW vehicles operating there. So there is a timeline on which the states or the beneficiary has to request the funds. They can't do it too quickly and they can't do it too slowly to ensure the funds are used correctly. So only one third of the funds can be made in the initial request. Another third of the funds can be made one year after the trust effective date. The trust effective date was October 2nd of 2017. Then the remainder of the funds can be requested after two years of that trust effective date. Then it is important to remember that all the funds have to be expended within 10 years of that trust effective date. If the beneficiary in the state does not use all those funds within 10 years, they can be reallocated to other states that have properly used and allocated all their funds. This last bullet point isn't to do with timeline, but it's very specific to this program and it's really important to keep in mind. Any vehicle that is um, purchased using funds from the mitigation trust fund, a similar vehicle has to be scrapped. So it has to be replacing a current vehicle that's on the road. So you have to scrap a more polluting older diesel vehicle that is currently on the road. So that scrappage is important to remember going forward if you're considering replacing vehicles. Um, so the beneficiary may use the trust funds for projects that fall into 10 different mitigation action categories. Um, you can review later, they all are described up on that banner over there. And in just a minute, I'll go through them in a little more detail with you as well. Um, so the goal of all the projects that are funded through this mitigation trust, the goal has to be max reduction. So um, the violations to the Clean Act were due to excess max being emitted. So the true, the primary goal is max reduction. There are other goals that can be considered as well, kind of tangential benefits such as greenhouse gas reductions, fuel security, um, location in an environmental justice area, things like that can be considered, but in the end it all has to come back to max. Um, so the trustee, Wellington Trust, does have to approve the mitigation plan, the mitigation plan that each state does come up with. Um, before any expenditures can be made. So now I will run through the 10 eligible categories. This is what was named in the settlement and can be eligible. This isn't necessarily what the state of North Carolina has decided they are or not going to fund in each round of funding. And this is just across the country what is eligible for anyone. So one of the probably most popular categories um, will be the repower or replacement of Class 8 trucks. Um, class 8 is your much larger vehicles, your, your semis, your dump trucks, your cement mixers, your waste haulers on the road. Um, the ones you're, if you're replacing them, they have to be between model year 1992 and 2006. And remember that the vehicles have to be scrapped. Um, the replacement and repower can either be for a new, newer diesel engine or an alternative fuel. Similarly, um, for school buses, transit buses, shuttle buses, you can also do repowers or replacements of these vehicles also. Um, this is for vehicle, two, year, vehicle year 2009 or older, also still has that scrappage requirement and still can be either diesel or an alternative fuel. Um, 
repower or replacement of switcher locomotives. Um, so prior to tier four, anything below a tier four can be repowered or replaced. Um, the rail switcher has to have more than a thousand hours of use per year. Really not as popular in the Raleigh area, but um, ferries and tugs um, can also be repowered. Not eligible for a complete replacement, but the engines in them can be repowered. Um, and they have to be a tier one or tier two engine at that time. Again, probably not as popular in the Raleigh area, but marine shore power is also an option. Um, any marine going vessel that is docked at shore, instead of having their diesel engine run for power the entire time they're loading or unloading a shipment, they can plug in with an auxiliary power unit um, and this equipment is eligible for funding. So similarly to the class eight trucks, um, eligible are the class four through seven vehicles. This is the slightly smaller um, trucks that are on the road, um, delivery vehicles, utility vehicles, um, beverage delivery, um, smaller refuse vehicles, tow trucks, vehicles about that size. Um, again, have to be between model year 1992 and 2009. Um, have to remember the scrappage requirement again and can be diesel or an alternative fuel. Support equipment at airports is also eligible for funding. Um, this, these are the um, snack trucks, the luggage trucks that you see zipping around the planes um, while you're boarding or boarding the aircraft. Um, this, these vehicles have to be switched over to uh, an electric engine, um, so cannot be a diesel option as EV only for these. Forklifts and port cargo handling equipment. Fork, forklifts can be anywhere. Um, the other port cargo obviously has to be at a port, um, but these are also eligible for repowered or replacement to an EV option. Um, light duty zero emission vehicle supply equipment. So this one isn't specifically funding the vehicle itself, it's funding the charging equipment for the vehicles. So charging infrastructure. Um, this has to be a publicly accessible infrastructure, so public at a workplace or a multi-unit dwelling. Um, and it can be either level one, level two, or DC fast charging. And it is important to note that beneficiaries can use up to 15% of their allocated funding for um, this EV equipment, but no more than that 15%. And the final option is combining it with current DARA funds. So the Diesel Emission Reduction Act um, has state funding programs. North Carolina already has their um, DARA funding program in place, you may have heard of it. Um, those programs require a match for those federal funds when they come in state. These um, trust funds can be used as that match to enhance the DARA program. Um, this would allow additional project types that aren't covered in some of the other categories. So it would cover agriculture, agricultural equipment or construction and off-road equipment as well. So that is all I have on the background of VW. Um, I now will invite Mike up. Mike is the Director of the Division of Air Quality at DEQ. He will go over um, their mitigation draft plan and the details for you with that. We will then, after he's done presenting, open it up for questions and comments. And there's a couple of seats right up there. 
Thank you, Andrew, and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, I'm Mike Eberzinskis, Director of the Division of Air Quality. It's great to see everyone this afternoon. Uh, really appreciate Andrea um, teeing up the, the Volkswagen 101 pieces uh, to the program today. Uh, and as she indicated, uh, I'm going to touch on uh, and discuss the draft, the preliminary draft of uh, the environmental mitigation plan. Uh, and so I'm going to begin and end with that important message of this plan is a draft. It's a proposal and we want to hear from folks on it and it's out for public comment until May 3rd. You've probably seen we have a, a email address where written comments will be received uh, but obviously we're here today to hear from folks as well so uh, our great staff are here to uh, capture all the questions and comments that we hear over the course of the meeting so we look forward to that uh, at the end of the presentation. Um, this draft plan was informed by some early feedback that we gathered um, shortly after the governor designated our agency as the lead or beneficiary uh, to administer the funds. And so that, uh, that next day in November, um, after the announcement, we released a request for information with some specific asks and really some broad questions as well, uh, just to get a sense of where interests lie on this matter. And so we, we took comment until the end of the year uh, through December 31st, and that really, uh, all of those responses helped shape the proposal we're here to discuss today. Uh, we received over 800 or 872 comments. There were some key messages that we wanted to outline from the, from the get-go here today. And we, we heard it loud and clear from folks during that RFI period uh, that we should invest the maximum allowable in the light duty zero emission vehicle supply equipment or infrastructure. Uh, a significant number of the comments were um, on, that, on that very point. And really, a little bit more narrow than what I just described it. I think it was more like invested in EV in infrastructure. So um, we heard that message loud and clear. We heard the message of don't forget the rural counties uh, because when you look at where some of the offending Volkswagen vehicles are registered across the state, it t tends to be where they're the greatest uh, population centers. So uh, there was a key message there, don't forget the rural counties. Um, one thing that became very obvious to us in reviewing the responses to the RFI um, was the overwhelming amount of public sector needs, that being far greater than the resources that are available. And then uh, another key message um, that we saw is that there's interest in a broad range of fuel types and equipment types. So let's start with a look at some baseline information um, that kind of launches us into the, the draft of the plan. And, and one, one early piece of information we wanted to look at, just to establish some baseline information and knowledge, is where, where did the NOx emissions come from in the mobile sector in North Carolina? And uh, Andrea mentioned that you know, the goal of this consent decree and the Environmental Mitigation Trust is to mitigate the excess NOx emissions or nitrogen oxide emissions that occur. So where are those NOx emissions coming from in the mobile source sector? And this gives you a little bit of an illustration by typical um, um, uh, sector within the mobile source sector. But maybe we should look at that a little differently and put it in terms of um, which one of those uh, types of emission sources within the mobile sector are, are actually eligible categories under the Environmental Mitigation Trust. And so that's indicated there in that second column. And what you'll find is about 44% of the on-road, or the, I'm sorry, 44% of the mobile sector NOx inventory is eligible under the terms of the consent decree. All right, so in other words, there's some really good opportunities to reduce some NOx in North Carolina with $92 million. So another baseline piece of information we wanted to share gets back to where are or were the offending Volkswagen vehicles registered at the time that the consent decree was entered in 2016. And so this map shows some of that information and it pretty much follows population centers as, as you would expect across the state. So if you, if you then look at how counties are classified across the state, and this is data provided by the North Carolina Rural Center, where the, the 
simply mapping whether counties are considered rural, suburban, or urban, um, you get uh, this display. So again, the rural counties in, in green, urban counties in blue, and the suburban counties in gray. But when you blend both this data and the data on the prior map of where the offending vehicles are located, oops, I skipped the one there. Um, oh, there it goes. You get this. And so the subject vehicles by county classification, and you find that 68% of the offending Volkswagen vehicles were in counties considered to be urban or suburban, and 32% of them were in rural counties. And so this serves, this data analysis serves as the basis in the proposal that we're taking comment on to distribute, at least in this first phase, 32% of the first phase allocations in rural counties and 68% amongst the rural and suburban counties. Okay. Some other goals uh, of the draft mitigation plan, uh, some obvious ones right off the top. We want to maximize the air quality benefits. Uh, consider where the Volkswagen vehicles were located. We talked about that already. Build upon some of our existing processes and programs to select projects. Um, you're, we've got our, uh, a team here from the Division of Air Quality with a great amount of experience administering grant programs that are very similar in terms of reducing NOx emissions from mobile sources. So we want to build upon that expertise in our processes uh, that we've, we've established over the last decade or so. We're going to consider environmental justice areas, and I'll expand upon that here in, in a few moments. Uh, we are obviously going to be transparent throughout this public process, and then right off the bat, we are committed because, we, again, we heard loud and clear due to the overwhelming responses in the request for information back in November and December, we're making a commitment to devote the maximum that is allowable under uh, the consent decree uh, to the light duty zero emission vehicle supply equipment or including, uh, of course, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure. So what we're proposing here initially is to break up this process into three phases. Uh, and, and this proposed plan is really focused on phase one. Uh, the, uh, Andrew mentioned that we're eligible to request the first third, approximately, of the funding here initially. And so we're, we're, we've kind of uh, established this phase approach in, in that manner. Uh, phase one would look at about a third of the total allocation to North Carolina over the coming years and focus on public sector projects only. Okay, so that's an element, a specific element of the proposed plan. We, we want feedback on We want to hear from folks on it. Um, should we consider public sector projects to include nonprofits? We'd like to hear from you on that. Um, so that, that is part of this proposal here for phase one. We have two other phases listed here for um, the remaining amounts of funds, but you'll note that the second phase, we're, we're proposing it would start approximately 2020. Well, by the time 2020 is here, we're eligible to ask for the remaining balance and request the remaining balance from the trustees. So another element that we want your feedback on is, should we just combine this phase two and phase three into one final phase? Again, we'd like to hear from folks on that. But let's talk a little bit more specifically about the phase one part of the plan here. And so what we're proposing uh, is as follows. Uh, first, a school bus replacement program. Uh, it would be, or it would include eligible uh, fuel types, all eligible fuel types, diesel, propane, natural gas, electric, with a target uh, funding percentage of 35% of the phase one funding or uh, $10.7 million. Next, we would propose a transit bus replacement program. Again, looking at all eligible fuel types, diesel, propane, natural gas, and electric, target percentage 20% or approximately a $6.1 million investment. Next uh, are, uh, would be called the Clean Heavy Duty uh, On-Road Equipment Program. So this includes some medium and heavy duty uh, class vehicles, all eligible fuel types again, diesel, propane, natural gas, and electric, target percentage of 10% or just over $3 million. The next element would be a clean heavy duty off-road equipment program targeting 15% across all eligible fuel types, 
for just about $4.6 million investment. And you'll note that that's kind of a combination of a lot of those eligible categories, or a number of those eligible categories listed on the banner over there that Andrew discussed earlier, including the DERA option. Next, we mentioned earlier the commitment to do the ZEV infrastructure, the zero emission vehicle infrastructure, up to the maximum that's allowed under the consent decree. So here is that commitment of 15% or a $4.6 million investment here in phase one. And then while the consent decree allows the beneficiary to claim administrative costs up to 15%, uh, what we're proposing is something on the order of 5% cover our cost for administering this during phase one. It may be more like 4%, but somewhere in that ballpark, we certainly don't need the full 15% that's allowed, and we'd rather that go toward good non-submission reduction projects. So let's run a hypothetical uh, for one of these categories, and, and specifically the school bus replacement program. So this is intended to just be an example, just to illustrate if we invested the $10.7 million in a school bus replacement, or 35% of that phase one um, allocation, how far would that go if you assumed a mix of new school buses in the numbers accounted for here, 77 diesel, 16 propane, five electric, would only get you 98 buses to be replaced for this initial allocation. Now, this by no means is a binding mix of fuel types. This is not representing a proposal in any way. It's simply to illustrate that with a different mix of fuel types and approximate cost, replacement costs for different fuel types of school buses, how far will it go? Um, we're also illustrating some of the potential emissions reductions that could occur per vehicle uh, for both NOx and fine particles uh, and across, uh, on a per vehicle basis and across uh, that entire suite in this example. But again, just to illustrate um, in, in one hypothetical scenario how far a $10.7 million investment could go in school bus replacements. Again, we're taking comment on all aspects of this and we look forward, forward to uh, talking more about that. Another piece uh, of the process is the funding process. And I'll admit, we don't have all the answers here yet, but we wanted to share some of the potential pathways for distributing funds as we proceed through this process. We're simply identifying some of these different um, funding vehicles, no pun intended, um, and, and, and want to hear from folks on this. Um, uh, and, and if you've had experiences with government reimbursement programs or payments and direct, direct vendor or, or voucher programs, we want to hear about those experiences, what were positive and what were negative. Um, we're, we're still in the process of working with our financial services folks and the Office of State Budget and Management to kind of better understand the pros and cons to each of these. First, a reimbursement option. Pretty obvious what that would entail, right? So if an entity wants to go purchase five garbage trucks and, and convert from old diesels to something else that's much cleaner and eligible. Um, under the reimbursement option, if they're selected, they would have to front the money to purchase those five vehicles and then wait for a reimbursement from the state. So that's possibly not an attractive option if they don't have the money to purchase those vehicles to start with. Um, so that's one option. The consent decree specifically outlines a direct-to-vendor option um, in, in that, uh, in the, uh, the five garbage truck example, um, if that's an awarded project, then we could authorize the trustee to directly pay the tab for the five garbage trucks, okay? So that might be attractive in some ways. It will probably also require some sort of contract, right, to, to spell out the terms and conditions of the agreement and all the things that are required under the terms of the consent decree. So we're, we're exploring that as an option. There's a forward-funded option could be tricky, but again, um, it would re likely require a contract as well. And then vouchers, which might be a, a, a weird blend of the direct -to vendor and forward funded. So we're looking at all of these options. Again, we, we don't have all of the answers yet on this, but just simply wanted to share what we're looking at and what we're investigating at this point in time. And we would love to hear from folks on this and hear from your experience. 
We mentioned an important element of this uh, will be an environment consideration of environmental justice. And what's that mean? Uh, to, to our department, environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws and regulations and policies. And to do that, we ensure that everyone is afforded the same degree of protection from environmental hazards and equal access to decision makers. So that's going to be a core piece to our process. And then one way we might incorporate that is in the selection criteria. And so we want to hear from folks on that. So I'll take a little time going through this element of the proposal, some proposed selection project selection criteria. Uh, I mentioned earlier cost effectiveness. It, it makes a lot of sense in, in considering projects here. And that's simply the, the amount of um, uh, Volkswagen dollars per unit of emissions reduced. Another consideration could be just the absolute value of the NOx emission reductions that occur over the life of the project. Another consideration would be the location of the project. We touched on that earlier, how many subject vehicles were registered in that, in that project area. Another criteria may be co-benefits, such as other emission reductions for other pollutants than the target pollutant. Um, for example, fine particle pollution or even greenhouse gases. The sustainability of the project could be another consideration. That's the longevity of the funded equipment. Timeliness. Another consideration, can you complete the project in a timely manner, in one year or two years? Uh, can we get this project in place right away? What about the useful life of the vehicle being replaced? This is borrowed from the Diesel Emission Reduction Act program, or DERA, where it gives consideration to um, vehicles that have some remaining useful life left, say two, three, four, five years left, rather than just replacing the clunker that just died. You're gonna replace that vehicle anyway. But is there a way that we can incentivize or advance the retirement of older, higher emitting vehicles that still have some useful life left? So that's a consideration. And then other selection criteria, um, for example, the environmental justice component I mentioned earlier, um, possibly innovative technology or approaches, something that generates some buzz, something that generates a proof of concept, perhaps, uh, could be considered in that other selection criteria. So, again, elements of this proposal that we would like to discuss and, and take comment on as we, as we move through the process. So I mentioned we're gonna begin and end with some of the very important information, so we're nearing the end. We're taking comment on all aspects of this proposal through May 3rd. The email address is important. Um, please be sure to reach out to us and, and submit your written comments. They, they mean a lot to us. There's a web address here that's really long, but I kind of like the short one, ncr.org. Just click on Volkswagen, that'll get you there a little bit more quickly. Um, we've been sharing this draft plan um, in, in over a series of meetings. We've been to Asheville and Annapolis. We were at Kinston last night. We're here in Durham today. Uh, sharing and, and, and information and, and getting feedback from folks will be in Wilmington at the end of the week. And so we're, we're again trying to get the information out there as best we can. If you know someone that's not represented here or, or you have email distribution groups um, and you think that um, folks are, um, are interested, I encourage you to forward this information to them. We want to make sure people are aware of the opportunities that are ahead and understand that really there are some narrow, pretty narrow categories of things that can be done with, with this funding. And, and that's, a, that's another thing that we learned through the request for information and reviewing some of those responses. We got an awful lot of project proposals um, that are simply not eligible, not, not even close to being eligible <laughs> under this consent decree. So um, that is something that uh, we want folks to, to understand. I think one other element in, in that early feedback that we got, and I didn't mention earlier, while that was not a specific request for proposals, we got some. Actually, we got $409 million worth of proposals. <laughs> and we only have $92 million to distribute. So, um, and, and some of that information is actually portrayed here on, on the graphs here on the board. Um, 
that bar, bar chart, feel free to walk up after the meeting's over, but the bar chart shows that we had over $350 million worth of proposals in response to the RFI in three categories, school bus replacement, transit bus, and other local and state government categories. So there, there are clearly a lot of needs right there in, in, in those three categories. Again, that helped inform this initial plan and that we're taking feedback on. In terms of some next steps, um, these are broad um, next steps at, at broad uh, and not so specific times. But just to give you a sense, because there's a lot that goes on in between every one of these bullets on the slide, um, we plan to uh, consider all the wrap up this, this comment period. Again, I said May 3rd. Um, consider all of those comments, make final adjustments to, to the plan here for, for phase one and get a final um, a plan together uh, by the summer of 2018 and submit that to the trustee. Uh, that could potentially launch us into a request for proposals for phase one uh, in the fall. Uh, we would be evaluating those pro proposals over the winter, possibly doing awards as early as spring 2019. Then we would launch into phase two, and it's listed here as fall of 2019, but that might be as early as the spring of 2019, because I think if we're at the point of awarding projects, we can we can launch into phase two pretty quickly thereafter. So we have all of our team of experts here, Brian, Robin, Phyllis, and Dave uh, at the table uh, who are doing all the heavy lifting. That They are our technical experts on this and have uh, decades of experience uh, combined here on uh, mobile source emission reduction measures and just really appreciate all that they're doing. Um, we look forward to um, having more of a dialogue and take some questions and do our best to answer them. So thank you very much. Portion. There are a lot of people in the room. I know a lot of faces here, but there's also a lot I don't know. Um, if you, before you state your question or comment, could just state your name as well as the organization you're representing. That would be helpful to um, the team from DQ up here. Um, I will, I'll just start on this slide. Just, it's also the handout that you have in front of you. If you'd like to reference any slide while you're asking your question or giving your comment, let me know and I'm happy to flip through. Um, if there is a big group, if for some reason we don't get to your comments today, remember you can email them in. There's also pads of sticky notes on your table. Feel free to write down notes and hand it to us or stay after, hand them over and make sure we get those comments as well. So. Um, does anyone have a burning question? Yes. <laughs> um, I'm Carrie Hobbs. I'm from the City of Greensboro Public Transportation. So we're uh, trained in the um, I understand I have advanced requirements with you. Um, one point I'll make is I have 30 that have already got used to life, but I'm just really trying to find money for it in the grand semester. So I'm trying to find the money. Um, but there's um, another nine that will hit useful life in 2019 and 2020, respectively. Um, if I replace those before they've met useful life, I owe FTA money. Is that something that the fund would cover? Would I have to pay back to FTA? Or? These are transit buses. Mm -hmm. That's something we spoke with the city. Um, Collins, I am. <laughs> <laughs> we spoke about this. Um, Deb, you want to explain the process you talked to me about that for the transit buses? So we've been working with FTA about ways to do this, and what we're probably going to have to do is to buy out the useful life uh, to meet Brian, the expectation of the plan to destroy the engine. So that's kind of the process we're going to be using. I do want to make a comment with a number of discussions in this one. Rick Sapien is a clean energy technology center. I've run into the issue that they are running a vehicle way beyond useful life because of budgetary issues. And you know, we, we went through this with the last round of the year for the regional. And we were asked to justify it. And they do a scoring system. And you know, from a business case standpoint, the private companies, that's what their struggles. 
It's going ahead of vehicles that have you select and pay for that business. It costs them a lot of money. That's why sometimes here at they struggle with the project. So there's, there's kind of two ways to look at that. The municipalities, I can guarantee you most of them, their vehicles are beyond useful life. It's not an issue. And then for the private sector guys, they, it's, you have to put a gun to the head to get retired vehicles ready. If I can build on that statement a little bit. Uh, my name's Jeff Bosch, I'm with Frank Leonard. I'm the manager of government contracts there. To put some numbers to this, that uh, perception, there's about 5,000 uh, municipal vehicles currently registered in the state of North Carolina that are of older emissions. About 2,000 of those are actually owned by the state. Um, the replacement of those vehicles based on an average age of about 16 years at this point would mitigate about 97% of the NOx. Um, from a funding perspective, couldn't agree more. Um, one thing that we have found at Freightliner is that a lot of the larger commercial concerns actually have replaced the vehicles uh, that are out there. And they've done that because of fuel savings and uh, uptime requirements. Where we see a real opportunity here is in the smaller carriers who have purchased these vehicles secondhand. Uh, and they run them out for the duration of the uh, life cycle and beyond. So that I think is going to be the challenge for you is trying to find the, the smaller owner and convince him to retire that vehicle ahead of time when he may not have <coughs> capital in order to do that on his own. Any other follow-up comments on that point? Uh, my name is Chris Ryder. I'm uh, the pastor of North Carolina. And um, I've got several friends that are uh, vendors uh, for Average Farm and other companies, and uh, that is very true. It's hard for them to, uh, as uh, small owner businesses, replace out the state vehicles. And I, my buddy just got into a 2007 box truck. He was in a 1991 Chevy van, like the big old ice cream truck van for the last six years. So uh, finding a way to allow those smaller operations to be able to take advantage of this and get into newer or lower costs, I think that is a priority. Question. Yeah, Lloyd Foreman. Um, what percentage have you allocated for private concerns versus municipalities? The proposal here in phase one uh, is to, to look at public sector projects only, but obviously w one of many elements we're taking comment on. So um, I used to work for Volkswagen, and one thing that, um, on a dealer level, um, and one of the things that I, I have had a concern about is that we're going to, in some places, spend a fair amount of money um, from the fund and give it to private corporations where this money came to the taxpayer payers from the EPA um, because of fines. And my experience was 95 plus percent of those Volkswagen diesels were sold to individuals. So they were, set, they were sold to individual taxpayers. And I, I think that the majority of this money should go back to municipalities. And then my one other uh, question is looking at the way that um, alternate fuel vehicles are uh, changing so quickly. You have 10 years to use this money, but it, I saw that you're looking to um, use all the funds by 2024. Uh, might it be, you know, a, a, an intelligent choice to go a little bit slower and see what happens over the next, you know, 10 years, and, and of course, let's say eight years until the funding can be spent within the 10, because we may have dramatic changes in what's available in the way of uh, vehicles. Thank you for that comment. That's something that actually we've heard some mixed messages on that latter point of go fast and get it done and get the improvements now, or spread it out, slow it down, wait for additional technological advances to come along, which means we could get a greater reduction but later, we're hearing, we're hearing both perspectives. So I appreciate all those comments, thank you. Uh, 
uh, Lisa Fogarty with Advanced Energy. Yeah, kind of following up on that question, I was wondering, is there a, a measurement and um, evaluation verification of these emission reductions throughout the program? And would it be prudent to measure those in the projects that you fund first to see what, how successful it is? You guys want to touch on measurements beyond the initial estimates? Visions. There's no requirements for that in the consent decree. Is that correct? Right. There's no requirement to do that. Um, that's what we could do. Do um, you have a vision of how that would work? Or <laughs> examples of other states that may have done something like that? We do know like Texas requires grantees to report to them annually on the um, mileage uses of their vehicles so they can calculate those emissions. The hard part would be to enforce that. So sometimes the money is what? I'm not worried about the state. <laughs> yeah, that, uh, that's what I would think, just reporting on um, the um, amount of travel the vehicles had and kind of just reinforcing the calculations that you put into the group model to get those reductions. Right. Do you think I'm valid will be Yeah. Uh, I can kind of build on the uh, reference that was just made there, uh, which is the Texas and I forget exactly what the acronym stands for, but it's the program that uh, Texas had in place for a couple of years to do just this. Um, while I think it's a valid question to make sure that you get what you're paying for here, I would encourage you to be careful on how far that goes. Um, the current legislation uh, is pretty widely viewed as rather onerous um, to the extent that um, I know there were several consultants who were charging up to $4,000 a truck uh, to monitor things. And it's the geofencing. It's the ongoing reporting. It's the requirements to then go forward into a second or third owner when you sell that vehicle, but they then have to do it. Has some implications as to the value of the equipment that's being sold as well. So uh, a little caution might go along. Thank you. Whitney Schmidt with ChargePoint. As a follow-up to what Lisa said, um, we would encourage that any deployment make use of smart charging and, and other smart technologies that provide very readily accessible analytics on emissions saved and, and things like that, uh, rather than relying on mileage uh, uh, mileage aggregates from uh, from the stakeholder who is, who is using the equipment. I have a kind of follow-up. Um, what we currently do with our DEER program, this is not required, but typically after a year, we will do follow-up visits just to, 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 to see um, how things are going. Like I said, it's not a requirement, but we do sort of kind of touch bases with them to see, okay, well, did you get the commission that you had planned to do? And that also helps us with our planning purposes as well. So it's not a requirement, but it is something that we currently do for the Bureau of Grants. Uh, I'm uh, Lynn Harris. I'm uh, an engineering consultant for the uh, North Carolina DOT uh, Rail Division. Uh, those of you aren't aware, we have a passenger rail program that we brought in North Carolina. I just got a comment uh, about the uh, funding breakdown. Um, those of you who are familiar with our program know that we're doing some pretty innovative technological things. Um, the clean air, uh, clean heavy duty operating equipment program, you've got several things specifically called out there, uh, but then you've got DARA funding lumped into that as well. The only way that an organization like mine would be eligible for funding would be through DARA, and I think it would help us tremendously to see a number for that broken out from all the other very specific items that are called out there. So I, I, I think that would be beneficial. To, it would be much more, uh, much easier uh, for, the home, uh, for me to be able to go to my management with a specific number to be able to say that you know we're eligible for a portion of this 4.6 million that's also dedicated to these other uh, categories. So just something to think about regarding funding breakdown. Yes, so uh, Stephen Spazadoway, County Public Schools. Um, Transportation. I was curious if you've got any feedback from DPI on on the uh, what you're proposing and how they're looking at. Um, I saw the breakdown of you know the example you gave and you know, the number of diesel versus electric and the cost per vehicle seemed on the diesel on the electric seemed higher than what I've seen. But 
any thoughts on a comprehensive sort of approach from DPI uh, since they t typically you know uh, acquire those vehicles and there's a program to you know to get new vehicles uh, just curious <laughs> We're very lucky. We had someone here that might be able to help with that. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Harrison from the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Generally with vehicles, uh, they, are op they are owned by the local education agencies. Uh, the state of North Carolina does replace existing vehicles once they have met uh, the legislated replacement criteria, uh, though we would certainly be looking to replace them early in this instance. Um, with, with grant funding, which we have done in the past. Um, so we, when we put in some information for the request for information, we sort of broke it down with the idea that we would uh, look at several different possibilities. We would, we would look at uh, the idea that most people would be interested in replacing um, with diesel, because that's the infrastructure that currently exists uh, at most, uh, most bus garage facilities throughout the state. Um, and then, um, but also some newer programs. Um, so we would be looking at uh, propane, because that's another easy fuel type for us. It can be transported in liquid form and pumped, um, which is another great advantage for us, because most of our vehicles are not located at a centralized facility and do not return to a centralized facility. Um, so we like being able to move the fuel around. Um, and then to look at emerging technologies, because I do believe electric vehicles is where we eventually land yeah. um, long term, yep. decades. That's where we land eventually. So I think it's important that we be a part of that. Well, all three bus manufacturers, school bus manufacturers, the major ones um, that bid in North Carolina have um, also produced this year um, electric vehicles, new electric school buses. And so we're interested in looking at their technology. It'll be a pretty big exercise for us as well because our specifications are fairly specific in North Carolina for school buses and it will require some learning and adjustments to see what would be required um, when moving to electric vehicles. So um, how we would choose fuel types would be we would talk with the LEAs involved but in addition to talking with them ultimately we would not force anyone to take a vehicle um, which they were not interested in having. So um, we certainly wouldn't say, here you go, uh, but this is a natural gas vehicle. Um, vehicles that were replaced would be replaced um, in consultation with the LEA, determining what type of new type of fuel or what type of fuel they wanted for the new vehicle. Um, and we would be replacing older diesel vehicles, uh, you know, and, but not the oldest, because we think that it is important that we move beyond the oldest ones, which we can foresee replacement of in the next few years based on the legislative criteria, and move a few years beyond that um, to some other engines that are still not, you know, the 2010 emissions engines, but are, are worthy of replacement. Does the grant though allow us, if we were to build a new facility, uh, to to put the infrastructure in the school in the school bus category? Does that allow for infrastructure to support electric? Um, it will allow for infrastructure for electric replacement Excuse me. Electric electric, electric only. infrastructure only. But some of the um, from what we heard from our Asheville meeting, some of the propane companies will provide that infrastructure for free. As long as you're buying the fuel, so um, there is that option. So can I follow up? So you're saying that the the Z vehicle infrastructure is electric only? No, 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 no. That's light duty vehicles. The Z V is for specifically targeted for light duty only. But for school bus and transit bus, we can also include infrastructure for those electric electric vehicles. So if you buy a bus, we can also cover the cost of the new charge and stuff like that. I was hoping to propose a small project with the Crest Natural Gas. Oh, I'm sorry, on Lake Snyder, we have a Department of Health and Human Services Murdoch Center in Franklin County. So I'm looking for a rural guys in that dot. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. 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 Yeah, that's what I was thin
kind of do a partnership with the project. Public service was the dummy. I've got the gas break there or something. They, they, they've got the equipment, but it's not a, uh, I haven't proposed any partnership. Hi, right, Denise Bruce, uh, Fancho and Sustainable Sand Hills. Um, real quick on the 15% uh, of that EV um, change out. How is that going to work? I do understand that you know a certain portion nationally, federally, is going to be spent on EV infrastructure. How will we be able to work with organizations doing that to kind of amplify that effect? And if so, to what are you guys are and what has already been done to start that process? Yeah, thank, thank you for that question and comment. Because actually, um, one thing we, we haven't mentioned yet we wanted to specifically talk about is First off, should there be a different set of selection criteria for that SIV infrastructure category um, in the light duty sector, different from what we've kind of discussed and outlined and want to take a specific comment on? Um, a, another question that's come up is, should we look at breaking from the public sector only approach in that particular category? because there may be some really good opportunities when you zoom out and try to establish a master plan for North Carolina in terms of filling in the gaps and coming behind Electrify America or what Duke Energy is doing and other entities, what's left and what makes the most sense for the state. And perhaps that should include, as it's been suggested in some of our prior meetings thus far, some private projects because it might be destinations like grocery stores or multi-unit dwellings that make the most sense to start filling in that infrastructure, some of those infrastructure gaps. So that's something we want to hear some more on from folks. Uh, it's something we, we've heard loud and clear at some of the earlier meetings. Uh, but uh, in terms of our thought process, um, and as we're, we're, we're going through this, I, I think there's a very good, diverse group of folks with lots of EV infrastructure intelligence already working together. And we're envisioning working with them to kind of put the meat on the bones for that part of this process. Um, I, I, I can't envision any other way to do it because those are the experts and, and represent, I think, all of the interested parties on um, EV charging infrastructure. I is there an obligation for the uh, infrastructure to be grid tied or standalone? I don't think there is. <laughs> uh, yeah. so grid tied versus standalone. I said a lot of hands go up while he was talking there, so I'm going to start here and work my way across. <laughs> go ahead. Thanks. Uh, my name is Emily Weir. I'm with the electric vehicle software company, Green Lots. Um, we have deployment throughout. North Carolina, mostly the DC fast chargers, and so, uh, you know, very supportive of the 15% investment um, and would definitely encourage uh, investment in public infrastructure. We see that that is really one of the big obstacles to getting drivers to drive long distances, and so um, what we would advocate as a strategy is to consider uh, DC fast charging along the corridors, um, you know, potentially at destination, um, and level two at, um, you know, at, at some, some mix of workplaces, multi-unit dwellings, um, and or in other places where you really need some, some infrastructure, and additional infrastructure, as well as at, um, at destinations. Um, like we have some, um, some of our chargers are out in the Great Smoky Mountains, for example. Um, but definitely like a comprehensive statewide plan to facilitate uh, long distance travel uh, is really, really advantageous. Um, and, uh, you know, I would also encourage um, early phasing in of EV infrastructure within the state uh, because these uh, benefits just kind of get magnified. If you have more e more charging opportunities, that will incentivize more people to drive, to purchase an electric vehicle. And then more private companies like ours are incentivized to then invest more in the market and it just kind of snowballs from there in a really positive way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Whitney Schmidt, Charge Point. Um, 
regarding public-private, thank you for uh, considering the private um, partnerships. We've, we're informed by extensive work with both municipalities and private um, private industry, and to make these funds go farther, partnerships with private entities who can contribute um, a good bit of funding toward the infrastructure being put in is going to go, it's going to make this funding go farther. Um, I've worked with a lot of municipalities and it's a heavy lift for them to do what is required to address this infrastructure. And they are willing, but the, the budgetary uh, obstacles can, can really be heavy and can be ameliorated by a lot of private, um, and in fact nonprofit as, as well, um, in, involvement. Um, we have some comments on DC Pass versus level two mix. Um, level two is the backbone of the industry and we'll, um, we'll expand uh, in, in, in written comment. Um, certainly a comprehensive plan toward transit corridors, DC fast charging, which currently just addresses just over 50% of the electric vehicles on the market. Um, level two in public areas is, uh, is something that can be deploy deployed very, very quickly. Um, but of course, it's important to get the proper mix in there. Great, thank you. I saw that hand first and we'll, we'll come back. Yeah. Quick specific question, but it was mentioned earlier that um, the EV infrastructure would have to go to spaces that are open to the public, and it, I didn't hear whether that was a set rule from the settlement or if it was part of the draft plan, and that was the first kind of part of that. And then, regardless of where it comes from as far as being open to the public, is there a more specific definition there? Um, I'm Darcy Downs, NC State, sorry, just said that first. Um, we have permitted spaces that we uh, have EV infrastructure that uh, they're open to the public in the evenings, on the weekends and everything. Um, we do also have some in our visitor lots which are obviously open to the public all the time, but I didn't know how that how, how that definition of public spaces would work. Yeah, it's not a requirement in, in the consent decree. It, um, we, we were talking in this proposal looking at public sector projects only, but we've heard over the course of the meetings thus far there may be some really smart reasons why to consider a mix of private and public <coughs> infrastructure category, but okay. it's not a requirement, correct, team? That those spaces be yeah. open, those, that parking space, the charging would be open to the public, that would not be a requirement. Correct. Okay. Sure, thanks. Can I ask a follow-up? You said you get NC State, so the charges you have are open to the public or just doing certain balance that you Right. Um, so we have some EV charging stations that are in our, what we call our visitor lots, so anybody can come and pay, if, like a regular pay lot, and use that uh, charging infrastructure. Um, and then and the ones that are in our permitted lot, you have to have the correct level of permit, whether it's a student or an employee permit, to park in that lot between 7 and 5, uh, Monday through Friday. Um, and you can also use the, the, uh, the EV infrastructure there. And then after 5 o'clock and on weekends, um, those spaces that were and I talked about that because we're permitted are open to the public. Uh, so if you want to get campus to the Dan Allen parking deck after 5 o'clock and uh, come in. Uh, yeah, and the reason why I was asking is I know that uh, Wake Tech Community College of their northern campus has some. But as far as I know, they were 24-7, I think. You, and it was a safety reason, obviously, you didn't want a whole lot of traffic with mm -hmm. the students. And that's what I was asking. It was, your plan was just interesting. I, I just wanted to... Yes, we're we're with. working with our EV permit holders uh, to kind of figure out how we're going to go forward with um, EV vehicles being registered on campus. We're looking into some changes to that, and so this kind of idea would, have, would affect maybe affect how we do uh, that program. Okay. Because the three allows for a different funding amount mm -hmm. for when it's not open to the public, so it wouldn't be 100 percent; it may be 60 or 80 percent. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. But it does allow for it. And would that be allowed, like uh, with the spaces that are with public, you know, after five? By percent, I mean, I hate to say by percentage. Um, I had a split hairs, but yeah, that'll be something we can look into. Okay, yeah. and I know that might be also true for apartment complex where it's residents only. Right. So. Mm -hmm. All right, go ahead. Yep. Good afternoon. I'm Michael Liu. I am a counsel with the North Carolina Electric Cooperative, specifically the North Carolina Association of Electric Cooperatives. Uh, First, thank you for all the work that DEQ is, is putting into this. Uh, the cooperatives really do appreciate the work. 
we serve 2.5 million, mostly rural North Carolinians. Uh, we were pleased with a lot of aspects of the draft plan, including the plan to invest 32% in rural counties. Uh, one concern we do have is something that various folks have mentioned. Uh, it is the limitation of phase one project eligibility to governmental entities. Uh, electric cooperatives are not governmental entities. Preliminary conversations with our members and some of our rural partners have indicated that uh, rural governmental entities may not have the same capacity as urban and suburban governmental entities to apply for and make full use of the 32% plan for rural investment. Consequent, consequently, as uh, one uh, entity that we've spoken with has put it, rural counties may end up leaving money on the table. That is something we are hoping to avoid. Uh, we believe a revision to the draft plan could address this concern, and so we would ask that you expand eligibility uh, so that private nonprofits are eligible for funding. And I think our initial request would be that that expanded eligibility cover both the 85% funding as well as the 15% funding. We have some members looking into electric school bus projects, and we may have members interested in replacement of bucket trucks. Thank you. Thank you. I think I saw one more hand over here. Yeah. Hi, Cassie Gavin, Sierra Club. Um, thank you for the draft plan as well. Um, we're really glad to see the environmental justice component mentioned, um, as well as 15% for UV infrastructure. Um, we have some concerns about the, the example of um, EV buses and school buses having so much diesel and propane, because that's continuing investment in fossil fuels. Um, so we'd really like to see more of a focus on electric buses, and I think, um, I guess this is a question for DEQ about um, whether life cycle costs were considered. When you look at maintenance costs over the lifetime of buses, you see a big difference between electric buses and others. So is that something you might consider going forward? Certainly, we, we appreciate that comment. Um, something we've discussed um, how, and continue to look at how to integrate that in potentially into our process. But yes, it, it's been part of the discussion, absolutely. Great. Um, some other sections that I haven't heard as many comments on, um, the proposed selection criteria, um, comments possibly about that. Um, also, possible funding structures. Um, any comments regarding those two sections? Yes, in fact. As I said, Harvey Richmond, uh, volunteer leader with the Capital Group of the Sierra Club. Uh, as Cassie does mention, uh, <coughs> important we think, in, as well in the selection process, to consider lifetime costs. Electric vehicles have much lower lifetime maintenance and fuel costs than CNG or propane or uh, diesel uh, vehicles. So I think that needs to be clarified when you talk about both the benefits and costs that you look at life cycle. And I'm going to leave you with a uh, National Sierra Club short report that talks about some of these issues, gives some analysis. Yes, I just wanted to really highlight the uh, COVID events. I know that primarily we do want the NOx reduction, but the COVID events as well, the continued um, investment in fossil fuels, probably not a great COVID event. Um, things things that will amplify this work so we get the most paper. Sorry, we need to say the same thing. My name is Liz Adams. I'm with the UNC Institute for the Environment and also a volunteer with the Sierra Club. Um, I also want to emphasize co-benefits, especially reduction of PM 2.5 because that has some of the highest health impacts in urban areas health impacts like heart attack, um, asthma. So if you're looking for environmental justice, it's important to look at those co-benefits. And I would also encourage you to calculate greenhouse gas emission reductions and include that in the tables. Any other comments? 
comments or questions on selection criteria? Yes, in the loop. Yeah, Wendell Arden from City with the sale. I think from the processing of how to retain it, um, we'd like to see some direct to vendor because that takes another loop out of the paperwork process. But also, we find that a lot of times the, the vendor provides project management as well. So we're not having to follow through with that as much as we would be from the time consuming the resource side. Thank you. Yes, yeah. I did have a question about the funding process. Do all four options to the funding process, I'm oh, sorry, I'm Ann the Lamb, I'm with the city of Raleigh, and I'm in transit. So do all four options for the funding process result in a contract between two entities? I think so. Yeah, that, and to be honest with you, Ann, that's one of the, um, we've been meeting regularly with contracts. I think one of the challenges is as we go through this process, obviously, you know, there's no pressure. And so some of the funding that we're looking at, we've never um, looked at before, like vouchers. So to be able to answer your question, unfortunately, we're not really sure that is something that, that we're looking into. And like Mike mentioned before, I know we have a meeting coming up with OSBM. Um, because there's a lot of um, legalities that we would also have to look at that we are not aware of. So, I'm not, not really sure if, if they, they would or, or not. Um, because one of the biggest questions that we talk about is like auditing and accountability. Um, so, we really have to be careful about how we go about that process. So, Phyllis, you want to explain a little bit about how we've done it in Dero? in a reimbursement role where we hold back a certain amount until certain terms and conditions are met? Yeah, the way that we, um, the way that we actually uh, do DERA currently, um, and DERA is funded through the Environmental Protection Agency, so we have to adhere to um, their rules and regulations as far as the funding. So it's on a reimbursement basis. So uh, the way that DERA is set up is that we can uh, fund up to 90% but we cannot give the final 10% until uh, the project is complete and we get a final report. It is, yeah, it is only on a reimbursement basis. basis so, um, and that's kind of how we came up with the um, funding stream because I think one of the gentlemen mentioned that everybody is going to have, obviously, the, the funding up front, and that would include some other government agencies. And so that's how we sort of uh, brainstorm and came up with the different options, especially with some of our, um, when you're looking at environmental justice. And, and one of the examples that we talked about is like the local boys and girls club. A lot of times they may use an older bus as an activity bus, but obviously they're not gonna have the money up front um, in order for them to go and pay for a new activity bus, but obviously there would be a need. And so that's how we were kind of looking at the different funding to ensure that, you know, as much as possible, um, legally and otherwise, as far as a consent decree, that we can, you know, fund a, a broad <coughs> audience as well. So, um, I know that was very long, and I'm not sure if I answered that. <laughs> and and we'll, we, we, like I said earlier, we, we don't have all the answers quite yet on this. I, I think there are a lot of attractive aspects to the direct -to vendor option, but how do we make sure that the terms of the consent decree are met if we do a direct to vendor payment or authorization to make sure those engines, the old ones, are destroyed and, and all of the other requirements that are in the consent decree are met. So, yeah, it may require some sort of contract um, to, to ensure that we can follow through and hold people accountable and, and make sure that everything's been done properly. We're still working through that. I hope that the next time we all get together, we'll have a little bit more information. But uh, definitely appreciate the perspective. Uh, Timothy Schwartz, I work at the Town of Chapel Hill, uh, Grants and Black, uh, the manager there. Uh, specifically, we wanted to talk about the transit bus replacement program. Uh, I know one of y'all's, uh, y'all were looking for early retirement of vehicles, and I know that's going to be really difficult for uh, pretty much statewide. I don't know of any uh, agency that doesn't have federal interest in their vehicles, and so trying to get rid of them from uh, use of life too soon will end up costing the agencies money. And so that might uh, limit your ability to get quality projects in that category. Uh, also, they're not running 20-year-old buses for fun. They're doing it because they have to for uh, meet, meet service demands. Uh, so I think you might want to look at trying to get some of your uh, worst offenders off rather than trying to retire early because those are going to be your worst offenders for uh, months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Joe Gilroy with the North Carolina Forest Service and just echoing comments from others. Thank you for all the work you've done and uh, talk, talked a bit um, during this process and I appreciate all of your cooperation on this. Um, I just want to echo the comments made about um, co-benefits. I think that's a really important piece um, on the decision-making process, especially on the, on the public side. Um, the thing that uh, I would recommend is maybe some standardized way of measuring or quantifying those co-benefits for the purposes of your all's scoring decision making um, so that we can better you know, objectify that process. I think that with um, you know, roughly $7.6 million um, targeted toward um, on-road and off-road equipment, that's gonna be an extraordinarily competitive you know, two categories right there. Um, you know, we have equipment needs um, with tremendous co-benefits um, that are except anywhere between 30 and $80 million worth of need. Um, so, you know, some of our equipment, and when I see, um, you know, some of the other, um, other pieces of equipment that we would be, you know, for lack of a better word, in competition with for funding, locomotives, ferries, tugs, I mean, those are not cheap pieces of equipment. So. Um, you know, our bulldozer, maybe that cost two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand um, dollars. You know, is you know, sort of important for us to, to obtain, but I just don't know how we'll be able to stand up to some of those larger pieces of equipment. Um, you know, unless some of those other criteria are uh, again objectified through things like um, uh, uh, quantifying co-benefits. on that a little bit, he discussed calculating the emission benefit of Pernax and other co-benefits. Have you discussed or have a plan in place for how you will do those calculations to um, evaluate all the projects coming in to ensure that all the calculations are being done similarly? Uh, we discussed it. Uh, Aethley has a tool out, the heavy duty diesel emissions calculator. That, um, I think most states are using that as a heavy calculator emissions. Also, there's the um, EPA diesel emission quantifier. That's another tool. It's not quite as the current data in there as the um, diesel emission one from Agent Labs does. But those are two, 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 those are two main tools we're using right now to calculate emissions. And also, piggyback off of what Brian said, um, throughout the process, there is a, um, a VW work group with other states. And so there is conversations that we have with other states. To, so we're not having to reinvent the wheel, but so there is some collaboration. And so obviously the emissions calculations is one of the main <coughs> topics of conversation that we have. Um, and so it, it, we do have that feedback with other states because uh, some other states like Utah have already started to develop the tools. So we've actually been talking with, with other states as well just to see what they're doing and, and um, trying to get feedback with other states as well. So. Could it also be an element in the request for proposals where we're requesting that information, not to say that we won't be checking up on it and doing our own calculations, but we could either request those reduction estimates or the data that's necessary to enable um, us to do that. Right? Yeah, just kind of following up on Mike, and, and there's a couple of, um, I know Joe and, and Kevin and Lynn that have actually um, applied for the Euro grants and um, a couple of recipients. But like I know Lynn is, is one of the personnel that when he does there, he'll actually run the diesel emission quantifier um, whenever he submits his application. And I think Kevin did as, as well. So um, a lot of these tools that we're speaking of are free to the public. So um, to be honest with you, like Brian mentioned Age Lead and some of the other ones. So if you do have a project, you always have the option of sort of looking through and, and sort of seeing what kind of emissions reductions you get and kind of looking at that. So. Um, as we go forward, um, like Mike said, we're still determining a lot of this. I would also encourage people to kind of become familiar with these tools as well for your own um, knowledge just to, to, to see. So um, so anyway, I, we do have applicants that have actually done that. Uh, so. Can I make yeah, one follow-up comment? I'm sorry. The uh, emissions quantifier on the EPA side, I felt like was very helpful and, and yes. had you know, several categories of, you know, um, you know, reduction, you know, what, what all is being reduced by replacing this piece of equipment. Um, you know, as, as you know, for us, um, the, 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 the equipment that we use is, is going to be for uh, wildfire um, 
uh, containment, you know, putting out a wildfire, but then also, you know, putting trees in the ground. So those are things that are not captured on the quantifier. So you know, if there if there was a way to expand the the um, quant, you know quantifying of co-benefits beyond um, what you know eliminating that particular engine would do, and then going beyond that to sort of like the environmental benefits way beyond you know what's coming out of the field pipe would be helpful. I'm sorry, my Anne Lamb sitting Raleigh. I was just concerned about your comment about requiring um, the grantees to to put in their diesel emission reductions or emission reductions for the project because like he was mentioning there's some that are really difficult to figure out some of them have an easy lift and others don't feel that they need to hire people to get that information from him i really don't think you want to encourage that so but to be honest with you and one of the um things that we talked about is something similar that we do with cmac where I know they provide like emission factors and new activities. Yeah, of where, it made it easy. Right, it made it easy, but everybody's using the same information, the same data. So mm -hmm. I know that was one of the conversations that Brian and I had as, as well, um, because that was a very straightforward methodology, and like I said, everybody's using the same thing, and it was quite easy. So like I said, you're not taking anything off the plate, but I know that was one, one thing that, that we had discussed. And as long as you have an open process where they can get some help from you yes, all. Yes, And to follow on with what, um, Phyllis just said we are planning on having, you know, after the uh, RFP comes out, the request for projects comes out, planning on having more meetings across the state to help people walk through, um, you know, how to apply to these plans and how to apply for projects. We're also going to have um, our cause help us out with this. We may have some train the trainers type of sessions so that they can help people who might not be is knowledgeable about filling out grant applications and putting projects together so that they wouldn't have to hire consultants. Yes. Lisa Pogger, Advanced Energy. Um, thank you for that. Um, having that information available would be really great for the, for the project proposals. One question I had is um, the VW working group with other states is that open to the public? And could you uh, maybe elaborate on project partners and how we might get involved in sharing information? You know, that's a good question. I don't you know if it is. I would have to ask. It's actually sponsored by the National um, uh, NASIO, which is the National Association of the State Energy Office. Yeah. <laughs> and back up, please don't ask me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I don't know. We can find out. I'm, you know what? I'm, I'm not really. That's a good question. I'm not. I'm not really sure. Um, but both of those national groups have gotten together and kind of heard the cat, so to speak, to kind of bringing us all all together. And I think we've only had maybe like one or two calls. Three. Yeah. Three. Yes. It's something that's actually quite quite new. Um, obviously, I think a lot of states were kind of we didn't want to rope around in the dark. So these two organizations decided to come together and then said, okay, well let's have um, dialogue. Like I said, so they can learn from each other. So. Um, yeah, I guess definitely something that I got to find out. I know Nazio also has a lot of great information on their website yes, they about do. what each state yeah. is doing so you can compare and contrast how um, yes. are very What What are the letters in the name? Yes, And the other one is N-A-A-C-A-A. And the national organization that we are a part of, APCA, APCA. is also, <laughs> so, so I think the, the shorter way to say this is there are lots of national and regional air and energy organizations that are engaged yes. and sharing information, <coughs> APCA, NASCA, NASIO, others. Um, and so, yeah, uh, and but most of those, especially on the air agency side, are simply the local and state air agencies talking and saying, okay, well, what are you doing? How are you, how are you overcoming this hurdle? Have you heard from the trustee on this? And yeah. how are you working that? And, and just kind of sharing notes from a lot of the program, yeah. programmatic side that probably y'all are less interested in, but also sharing of tools and data that's important in evaluating projects in the long term. And certainly we want to get that information and push that out as well and share that with everybody that's interested. And just one follow-up question. Has Electrify America been involved in any of that conversation? No. They did okay. one, they did one they presentation. Did the first they did the first presentation for the first phase, but it wasn't, it was very big. Yeah, they have, um, I think the first call, and I think one of the 
uh, in case you didn't know, Electrify America is the uh, subsidiary that PW created to specifically address the EV infrastructure. And Raleigh is actually one of the first cities that has been chosen. Um, but when we had our first meeting with them, the kickoff meeting, they weren't really forthcoming because if they said because of the real estate, they didn't really want to share what they were looking at because there was a concern that real estate calls would increase. So to be honest with you, we've not even as a state agency actually seen a final plan of where uh, EV America actually intends on placing um, their charter. We have general location, but not Yeah, general location, but I can't tell you that it's going to be on you know, six forks in the middle, but we don't have like that specific information. I heard that they were on working on contracts with several locations, so hopefully once those contracts are in place, we shall have soon. And yeah. just so no one's confused, that's separate and apart from the Environmental Mitigation yes. Trust yes. and that line item right there of the ZEP infrastructure, separate and apart from that, just, just to be clear. Yeah. Great. Well, way in the back there. I wanted, um, my name is Liz Adams, I'm with the Institute for the Environment and also a volunteer with the Sierra Club. I wanted to also ask about tools to uh, measure the health benefits of these reductions, emission reductions. So emission reductions um, will have a certain impact on the air quality and the air quality is slightly different than the actual emissions that are reduced. Will the state be doing uh, some sort of study using BenMap as a tool from the EPA or other air pollution study to determine how much uh, the emission reduction has re has helped improve the public health. Uh, that's not part of the proposal, but we've got our first comment on that right now. So yeah. we'll, take, we'll take that into consideration and appreciate that. If I'm not mistaken, doesn't the uh, EPA uh, website also have a uh, tab that allows you to calculate health benefits as long as well as uh, air pollution reduction? Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there are tools that I think you can use for both. Yep, absolutely. Yes. Hi, I'm Mr. Shapiro, from Bluebird Bus Company. <coughs> um, we appreciate you putting so much emphasis on the school bus part of this. Uh, we do manufacture all these fuel types, um, but just a particular propane, you know, speaking of the eighth fleet, we figured <coughs> really put a lot of emphasis on propane due to the fact that we get the most bang for our buck with propane. Essentially, it costs the least to reduce the most amount of NOx with propane. So that's why you've seen a push from us and from our partners at Rash to sort of you know bring that to your attention as well. So we hope that you take that into consideration as well. And um, also a follow-up question: of the 35%, I noticed the 97 plus um, comparison or example you had up there. Are you considering? taking less of, are, it seems like you're funding 100% of the bus. Are you considering funding less than 100% of the bus and spreading that 10 million out further? We're taking comment on that. I think we, we have some um, questions ourselves about what is, um, in North Carolina, what are the rules and laws for repowering buses versus replacing them? So that's something that I think we look forward to talking to Kevin a little bit more about to better understand um, what, what's possible. Mm -hmm. But after, in general, under the consent decree, the repower is most certainly allowed. Right. Under our proposal, we talked replacement only, but that was just because we have some more learning to do with DPI about the, if repowers are really a, an re option. So then a follow-up question. Um, <clears throat> repowering is to current emission standards only. So we would be talking at the time of replacement, you know, if we're saying 2022, we need whatever the emission standards are as of that date, the repower would need to be more. Yeah. Gen generally speaking, the difficulty for um, for repowers <coughs> is getting to the current emission standards. You have to have somebody that has a plan to repower to the current emission standards. And at least in school bus, that hasn't existed yet. We don't have any repowers to current emission standards that I can point to in any um, in any fuel type. Um, even diesel to diesel, we don't have a repower to current emission standards. We can repower up, um, but not not all the way to present. And one thing we consider is cost share. Because it's cost share. Sure. Um, some entities can't do a cost share, so that's how do you balance those two out, those two needs out, but getting those projects out, the ones that they did, they'll have enough to cost share, and the ones they can't cost share. 
future. So how do we do that and also evaluate those two pieces of other group from separate? Yeah. Yeah. I know there haven't been really assistance for the incremental cost of diesel over propane in North Carolina, so if we could sort of put some money towards that, I think it would really spread the, you know, the message about propane a lot more district would jump on. Okay, see a question here? Okay. Uh, Keith Donald with Elon University, and uh, I'm asking, the, uh, we're, we're a private nonprofit organization and we've been involved with alternative fuel vehicles uh, in our fleet since 2006. And I was just asking if it's possible to make us eligible to be part of the, the phase one uh, if that opportunity comes. Well, we've got more, put this way, we've got plenty we want to, we want to keep moving in our alternative fuel for time. Make sure I heard you correctly. You said Elon is a private nonprofit. Is that what you said? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Denise Bruce, um, Santa. Um, question about uh, airports and um, ground equipment. Um, whenever I first put this in front of our local regional airport there in Fayetteville, um, in front of the operator, this first thing out of his mouth was all of our ground equipment, transportation equipment is owned by the airline. But the airport itself is publicly owned. And I'm wondering if there's anything in this space, one, that would be able to, uh, I guess, more of a public private thing, where it's private, public entity being served by private, and how that would work. Um, because otherwise, I mean, they would love, he would love at the regional airport to move to electric ground transportation, but. Um, with the way that phase one is set up, he cannot he cannot ask the airlines to do that at this point because they're kind of they're pushed out of that. We heard a similar comment in um, Kinston or Canapolis about um, how a lot of refuse trucks um, are owned by private companies, but the you know the um, cities and towns use them. Yeah, the so uh, they're contracted. So that would also be an example of. That. <laughs> Could you go back to the calculations on the buses? I'm a little confused on the emissions reduction. So for essentially $100,000 diesel bus, you get a 0.85 reduction in NOx, and for 400, you get a 0.357. If you divide that 3, 0.357, it's 0.088. So it's actually cleaner per dollar from this chart. I haven't done the, <laughs> I haven't done the math. Um, <laughs> like I, I see what you were saying. So the emission reduction per vehicle for electric is 0 0.357 for $400,000. For a diesel bus it's 0 0.085 for not $5,000. So it's a quarter of, quarter of the emissions there. So I'm confused by this. Because <laughs> yeah. I think the electric bus is actually a little cleaner for dollars for diesel. And, so and also, price. if I might just, just to inform the chart, perhaps, I, I think we, we may have diesel and propane reversed because the diesel buses are less expensive than the propane buses. Mm -hmm. so For the emissions? I, I would assume not because the, if this is based on the new 8 fleet tool, the newest 8 fleet tool essentially says diesel vehicles don't do as well as they certify. Uh, so, so there's, I, I would assume that it's accurate, but I don't get the dollar values in the room. Uh, you did? Okay. Well, then I'm not sure. Well, we used the camera duties for emission from these. From these. From, from. So you probably use some of those calculations. So then I believe it might be accurate, but the dollar values are the first. And, and keep in mind, we have lots of different sources of information. And we, we contemplated whether we should even show this illustration or not, or whether we should show ranges of values amongst all the different sources of information that we have. So um, simply an illustration, we recognize that there may be some variability in costs or even reductions if you get down to the third decimal point or something like that, depending on the tool that you use so or the source of information. So, yeah, I just um, wanted to clarify that that right-hand column is a little misleading because it's five electric buses, that's the emissions you get versus 77. Noted, absolutely. <laughs> We have about 
15 minutes left in this meeting today. Any other questions or comments for DEQ? Yes. Spreader, plug in and see. Uh, going back to the uh, the seven amount, uh, are we allocating 15 percent per phase or total 15 percent over the uh, total allotment, or how are we how are we handling that? Yes, th thank you for that question. Um, and just to clarify, uh, we, we are committing up front the 15 percent throughout the maximum throughout to the zero emission vehicle. Uh, John Jessup, North Carolina Propane Gas Association. Can you guys elaborate on a little bit of the process once the request for proposals come in? Because what do the other groups have to go through? Does it have to go to the legislature and be approved by committees, or does it end with you guys? Or how, how would that process, how would you finally be able to select projects that will be eligible? Right. Um, well, we want to hear from folks on all aspects of this, but what we're envisioning at this time is certainly we're going to um, finalize the plan after considering public comment, produce that to all entities that are interested, including the General Assembly, uh, as the final plan, uh, start launch that into an RFP process, um, whether we establish a, a selection committee um, or we uh, or you're looking at the selection committee, we're not sure yet, we're, we're going to work through that process. I think we, we probably lean toward establishing a selection committee that we support. Um, and, and so we're, we're working through that concept right now um, and then um, report out from there to all interested parties, everyone. Um, there uh, seems to be a little confusion about whose role is it to approve a project. Uh, clearly, the trustee must approve the projects, uh, and, and there are specific processes for the beneficiary to follow as we get to that stage. Um, I think you were at some of the legislative meetings and heard some of the sentiment uh, from the committees that have heard this thus far. I, I think I don't want to misspeak for them, but I think I heard that um, you know there, there's not a lot of interest in getting in the weeds, but I don't know how that'll go. So I think we'll we'll see. But right now, I, I think that's the best explanation of the plan moving forward that we can give at that stage of the process. Okay. Yeah. Our, our, um, again, if you'd like to talk with me one-on-one -on -one or any of us on team one-on-one -on -one about that aspect of the process or have some thoughts on that, we'd love to hear from Is there a plan by the state for uh, future electrification of the transport sector and possibilities also for vehicle to grid stabilization of the uh, electric uh, for resiliency and other purposes? I'm just wondering if this couldn't supercharge some of those efforts moving forward. Yeah, thank you. Uh, th there's a lot of a big picture thinking going on right now, uh, and, and hope to be able to share some more about that soon. Uh, that's bigger and broader than this team and, and our division and the Division of Air Quality. It, it, it would include our, our energy team, our entire department, and obviously uh, lots of other agencies in a, kind of a comprehensive um, policy package. So not something that I think we're ready to talk about in detail today, but uh, there, there's a lot of strategic thinking going on. Uh, Roger, we'll get and see. So I've got some comments on the ZEP uh, uh, investment. Um, in the short term, because uh, I feel that most of this will be deployed by 2020, I think it would be prudent for us to focus strictly on level two deployments. Um, personally speaking, uh, my family has four EVs. Uh, we do not drive a single vehicle that has any more combustion engine wheels 98% of the time when we go places. I have taken these vehicles to South Carolina. I have taken them all across the state. Um, just this weekend, I clocked 700 miles on two battery-only vehicles on um, two different trips on two different days. The biggest problem I find is um, on a day-to-day -day basis, I can't plug in conveniently at the grocery store. Um, this is a bigger problem for short-range vehicles, which are being phased out as the battery technology improves. But those vehicles still have a good 10-year lifespan on them. Someone's going to be with it. And it's a bigger problem in the winter. Even though it's only 10 days out of the year total, my range gets cut by about 30% when those days do come about. And that's a big deal. That means that when I come out here in Durham, I must be able to plug in and charge to get back to NCC. Um, beyond that, 
Uh, I do think that it is prudent to wait if we're going to do DC installations because there are two standards. It looks like everyone's going to CCS, but in three years, something new may come along that's going to be the better universal connector. Um, let Volkswagen handle that because that seems to be what the federal government has largely tasked them to do with Electrify America is to make rapid, tra rapid charging available for distance travel. We should be focused strictly on the local areas. And to further that, um, I cannot drive any one of my cars to Wilmington down 40 and charge it at all, period. There is no charging infrastructure that exists practically east of Wake County. I am a huge proponent in electrifying all of these smaller outlying counties first and doing it with level two because you get someone in a bolt, which is a plug-in hybrid, they're able to buy a battery only vehicle because they realize I only drive 5,000 miles a year. Why do I need to have the gas engine in its maintenance? The product sells itself, but we need the infrastructure and the visibility. Lastly, signage. We need signage to identify where these chargers are. Durham has done a great job with this. Raleigh, a dismal job with it. Um, I have seen much better signage about this is for electric vehicle charging, move your vehicle when it's done, versus this is electric vehicle parking only. That is helpful um, to have it marked so that people don't block the charger with a car that can't use it, also that they don't bogart the space for eight hours when their car charges at four. Um, and the last comment I've got uh, before I close, uh, also regarding signages, I would like every single charger deployed through this to have uh, some sort of designation that this was brought to you by the Volkswagen Air Quality Settlement. I do not want this company, a company that defrauded me of over $91,000 repurchases over five years, to ever be able to spin this as positive PR about how they were the first to help the future. This is a punishment, and I want it to permanently be remembered as such. I'm going to piggyback on what he said about east-to-west corridors in North Carolina. You leave Fayetteville and you head to Charlotte and one of five different ways you can go that way other than an interstate, good luck charging your vehicle. <laughs> it, there, are, there are a few, it's gotten better, but it still is not like driving across I-85. Um, and it's just our rural counties really, really need that help. Really need it. And that is not a state representation, that is I have once again brought up the email address. I know oftentimes after we leave meetings, we think about the discussion a little bit more and something else pops into our head. Please write down the discussion. They are taking comments until May 3rd. Um, they have been kindly given you their contact information. So um, feel free to reach out if there is something you need more information about. Um, we do have a few more minutes. We can take one or two more questions. Otherwise, I'm guessing you won't be able to hang around for a few minutes for a one on one discussion. So feel free to stay back and have one on one discussions if there's more specific questions you have for them.